Section 14. How I vainly tried to explain the nature of flatland. Thinking it was time for me to burst the monarch's bubble of fantasy and bring him back to the realm of common sense, I decided I was going to try to get him to understand some of the real truth of the world, the way things worked in flatland. So I started with this. Your Royal Highness, how do you tell the shape and position of your subjects? I noticed through my sense of sight before I entered your kingdom that some of your people are lines and others are points, and that some of the lines are longer. He interrupted me with, you are talking nonsense. <clears throat> you must have been hallucinating, because it's impossible to see the difference between a line and a point. You can only tell them apart by hearing, which is also how the exact measurement is taken. Look at me and behold, I am a line, the longest in lineland, over six inches in space, in length, I corrected. Idiot, he snapped. Space is length. Interrupt me again, and this conversation is over. <clears throat> I apologized, but he was still angry and continued scornfully. Since you refuse to listen to reason, you will hear with your own ears how the sound of my two voices allows my wives to calculate my exact measurements. One of my wives is to the north, and the other to the south. They are both 6,000 miles, 70 yards, 2 feet, and 8 inches away from me. Now, listen while I call to them. He chirped loudly, and then casually continued, My wives will hear one of my two voices first, and then the other. By counting the time between hearing the first voice and the second, they will be able to calculate the distance between my two mouths. One is 6.457 inches away from the other, which tells them that my total shape is 6.47 inches. But don't pretend to think that they perform this calculation every single time they hear me speak. They knew my shape before we were even married, but they could recalculate it at any time just as easily. By this same method, I can tell the shape of, my, of any of my male subjects through the sense of sound. I asked, but what if a man pretended to have a woman's voice by using just one of his mouths, or, disgu or disguised his southern voice so that you couldn't recognize it as an echo of the northern one? Wouldn't this cause a lot of problems? Don't you have any way to make sure people are telling the truth by feeling one another? Obviously, this was a very stupid question, because feeling wouldn't have worked in Lineland, but I asked it just to annoy the monarch, which worked perfectly. What? he cried in horror. What do you mean? Feel, touch, come into contact, I replied. If when you say feeling, said the king, you mean getting so close to someone that there is no more space left between you, you must know, stranger, that this is a crime punishable by death. And it's obvious why. Women are so fragile that they would probably be shattered by the slightest touch, as you call it, and since it's impossible to tell women from men using only sight, it is illegal for anyone to touch anyone else. And why would anyone want to do such a dangerous and illegal thing as touching, when simply listening is so much easier, safer, and accurate? And as to the idea that anyone could successfully lie about their shape, that's impossible because your voice is the whole essence of your being and cannot be changed as easily as you pretend. But let's imagine that I did have the power to pass through solid objects, and I could go through all the billions of my subjects without hurting anyone, verifying their shape and the distan and distance by the sense of feeling. How much time and energy would I have to waste with such a clumsy and inaccurate method? All it takes right now is a single moment of song, I now know, and I know everything there is to know about every being in Lineland. Listen, just listen. <coughs> <clears throat> And then he paused and listened, as if delighted, to the many noises made by his people, which to me just sounded like a bunch of tiny crickets, the kind you might find on the fictional island of Lilliput from Gulliver's Travels. Truly, I said, your sense of hearing does help you a lot and fills in the gaps of your problems, but allow me to point out that your life must be incredibly boring. You can see nothing but a point. You can't even see a straight line. You don't even know what a straight line is. You miss out on all of the things we enjoy in Flatland. I think it would be better to be entirely blind than to see so little. I'll admit that your hearing is more advanced than mine because the music of Lineland that you enjoy so much seems like basic chirping to me, but at least I can see the difference. <coughs> 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 
but at least I can see the difference between a line and a point, and I'll prove it. Right before I entered your kingdom, I saw you dancing back and forth from left to right, with several men and a, men and a woman on your left side, and eight men, <clears throat> with seven men and a woman on your left side, and eight men and two women on your right. Aren't I correct? You're right as far as the numbers and sexes go, said the king, but I don't understand what you mean by right and left, and I know you're lying about seeing these things. How could you possibly see the line, the inside, of any man? You probably heard this information and then hallucinated that you saw it instead of hearing it. But tell me what the words left and right mean. I assume it's your way of saying north and south? <clears throat> no, I said. Besides the movement from north to south, there is another way to move, called from left to right. Then please demonstrate how to move from left to right, he said. I can't show you that, I said, unless you could step out of your line entirely. Step out of my line? Do you mean out of the world? Out of space itself? he asked. Well, yes, I said, or at least your version of the world. What you call space is not the entirety of it. Real space is a plane, but you think it's only a line. If you can't show me what this movement for left to right looks like, then please describe it to me in words, he said. <clears throat> If you can't even tell your right side from your left, I don't think anything I can say will make it clearer to you, I said. But surely I don't need to explain something as basic as that. I have absolutely no idea what you are talking about, he said. Alas, how am I supposed to explain it to you then, I asked. When you move forward, doesn't it ever occur to you that you could go a different way? By going in the direction your side is facing? Instead of always moving forward or backward, haven't you ever wanted to move to the side? The king said, No, never. And what do you mean? How can a man's insides face in any direction? How can a man move in the direction of his insides? I said, Well, since words can't explain it, I'll try showing you with actions. <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out where my water bottle went. Since words can't explain it, I'll try showing you with actions. I will slowly move out of line land in the direction I'm trying to explain to you, okay? Then I began to slowly move my body back out of line land. As long as any part of me was still in his view, the king kept saying, I still see you. I still see you. You're not moving. <clears throat> Image description start. A diagram showing a blue line labeled Lineland. There's a short black line labeled The King on the left side of the image, and in the center is a square intersecting Lineland with just his lower angle. The rest of his body outside Lineland <clears throat> is covered in horizontal lines showing which parts would be intersecting Lineland at a time labeled My Body Just Before I Disappeared. Image description end. <clears throat> But then I was out of Lineland, out of his line of sight, and he shouted, She has vanished! She is dead! I'm not dead, I said. I just moved out of Lineland, the straight line that you call space. I am in the real space, where I can see everything. I can see your line, your side, or side, which you call your insides, and, and I can also see the men and women on the north and south sides of you. I'll now describe to you their order, their size, and the distance between them. <clears throat> this took a while, but when I was done, I cried triumphantly, Are you convinced now? Then I re-entered Lineland in the same spot I had held before. But the monarch replied, If you are a man of sense, though, considering the fact that you have only one voice, I know you are a woman, but if you had any sense at all, you would listen to reason. You expect me to believe that there is another line besides the one that I can see and hear, and another range of motion besides the one I can move in, 
but when i ask you to describe these to me in words or show me them instead of moving you just play some trick to make yourself invisible and instead of actually describing the world that you claim exists you just tell me the numbers and sizes of about forty of my subjects which is information that is readily available to everyone here at all times down to the smallest child could anything be more unbelievable or audacious just admit that you are lying, or else get out of my kingdom. <clears throat> Enraged by not only his continued failure to understand the most basic things, but also his insistence that I wasn't a man, I retorted angrily, You self-absorbed fool. You think you're the most perfect thing in existence, but you're really the most flawed and idiotic. You claim to be able to see, but all you see is nothing but a point. You're so proud of your ability to calculate a straight line, but I can actually see straight lines and calculate the existence of angles, triangles, squares, pentagons, hexagons, and even circles. Why should I waste any more breath? I am the final evolution of your unevolved form. You are a line, but I am a line of lines, known to my country as a square, and even I, who am so superior to you, am nothing next to the great nobles of Flatland, which is where I have come from, to visit you in the hopes of making you less ignorant. <clears throat> when he heard my words, the king gave a threatening cry and charged at me, as though to pierce me through the diagonal, and at the same time a roar arose from the billions of his subjects, a war cry so loud and violent that it rivaled the volume of a hundred thousand charging isosceles and the artillery guns of a thousand pentagons. Frozen in place, I couldn't speak or move to avoid this horrifying death sentence, and still the noise grew louder and louder, and the king rushed closer, until suddenly I woke from this nightmare to hear the breakfast bell calling me back to the reality of Flatland. <clears throat> Section 15. Concerning a Stranger from Spaceland That was my dream, and now we move on to the facts. It was the last day of the year 1999. The sound of the rain had announced the fall of night hours ago, and I was still sitting with my wife, thinking about the events of the past, and what might happen in the next year, and the next hundred years, and the next thousand years. Note from the author, when I say, sitting, Obvious I don't mean the way you think of it in Spaceland. We Flatlanders have no feet, so we can neither sit nor stand the way you think of it any more than a flatfish could. Despite this, we share the same differences in relaxation and activity implied with the words lying, sitting, standing, walking, and running. The difference can be seen through a lower level of brightness for someone who is more relaxed and brighter for one who is at attention. But I don't have the time to explain this and a thousand other similar things in detail, so let's move on. <clears throat> my four sons and two orphaned grandchildren had gone to bed in their rooms, and only my wife and I stayed awake to see the old millennium out and ring the new one in. I was deep in thought, thinking over the words my youngest grandson, a promising young hexagon of unusual brightness to his sides and perfect angularity, had said so casually earlier. I had been teaching him, with the help of my two sons, the art of sight recognition. My sons and I had spun in place, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, and asked my grandson to tell us which way we were facing. He'd answered correctly so many times that I'd decided to reward, that I'd decided to reward him with an extra private lesson in geometry afterwards, with just the two of us, and my wife, who kept to herself, while my sons went to their beds. Taking nine small toy squares, each one inch by one inch, I had put them together so that they made one large square, with sides of three inches. <coughs> <coughs> this was to show my little grandson that even though we couldn't see the inside of the toy square, we could still figure out the number of inches of space it took up by simply squaring the number of inches in a single side. A note from this new editor. For those unaware, the small and tall symbol 2 means squared, which means you multiply the number that is being squared by itself. This is also called the second power or to the power of 2. 5 to the second power is the same thing as 5 squared, is the same thing as 5 with a small 2 above it, or 5 times 5. 1 to the second power is the same thing as 1 squared, or 1 with a small 2, or 1 times 1. 
to the second power and squared can be used interchangeably. I'm not sure why a square assumed that this would be common knowledge. End of second editor's note. And so, I said, we know that 3 squared, which equals 9, represents the number of square inches in a square whose sides are 3 inches long. <clears throat> Image description start. A black and white illustration titled, 3 rows of 3 equals 3 squared equals 9 square inches, showing a large square labeled myself and a small hexagon labeled my grandson looking at a collection of very small toy squares. One toy square is by itself and is labeled to show that all sides are one inch long. Next to this are nine more of the same toy squares stocked on top of each other to form a larger square, which is labeled to show that each side is three inches long. There's a black border around the image. Image description end. <coughs> My little hexagon grandson thought about this for a while, and then said, So, you're teaching me how to raise numbers to the third power, which would be three with a small three. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, I replied, at least not in geometry, which only has two dimensions. Oop. Uh, I clicked the wrong spot. <clears throat> and then I began to show him that if he took a point and moved it parallel to itself 3 inches, or 7.62 centimeters, it made a line 3 inches long. This could be represented by the number 3. Then, if he took that 3 inch line and moved it parallel to itself 3 inches, it made a square of 3 inches every way, which could be represented by 3 squared. Image description start. A simple grayscale diagram showing a gray line connected by two black points with an arrow instructing, moving a point parallel to itself creates a line. Next to this is that same line moving downward to form a square, with the arrow instructing, moving a line parallel to itself creates a square. Image description end. When he heard this, my grandson startled me by suddenly yelling, so if a point moving three inches makes a line of three inches, which is represented by three, and if a straight line moving by three inches makes a square that has three inch sides, represented by three squared, then that means that a square, somehow moving parallel to itself, though I don't see how it could do that, must make something else, whose name I don't know, and this mystery shape would be represented by three to the third power. I was right! Go to bed, I said, annoyed by his interruption. If you'd talk less nonsense, you'd remember more sense. So he had left the room in disgrace, and now I s sat beside my wife, trying to summarize to myself the events of 1999 and think of the possibilities for 2000, but unable to shake off the ideas my bright little hexagon had prattled on about. Only a few grains of sand were left in the half-hour glass. Shaking myself out of my thoughts, I turned the heavy end of the hourglass northward, resettling it for what would be the last time in the old millennium, and as I did so, I exclaimed aloud, trying to convince myself, THE BOY IS A FOOL! Immediately, I became aware of a presence in the room, and felt a cold chill spread through my entire body. He's not a fool, cried my wife, and you are breaking the commandments by dishonoring him in saying so. But I ignored her, spinning to look in, <clears throat> spinning to look around in every direction. I couldn't see anything, but I still felt a presence and shivered as another wave of cold washed over me. I stood up. Why are you shivering? My wife asked. There's no draft. What are you looking for? There's nothing. She was right. There was nothing. I sat again and exclaimed again. The boy is a fool. Three to the third power doesn't mean anything in geometry. Immediately, a voice very clearly replied from nowhere, The boy is not a fool, and three to the third power has a very obvious meaning in geometry. My wife heard the words, too, though she didn't understand what they meant, and we both leapt forward in the direction the sound had come from. 
Imagine our horror when we saw a figure appear in front of us. At first I thought it was a woman seen from her side, but after a moment I realized that the edges faded too quickly to be a member of the female sex. I would have thought it was a circle, except that it seemed to be changing its size and shape in a way that was impossible for a circle or any other regular figure I'd ever heard of, even while rotating in place. But my wife lacked my experience with sight recognition and didn't notice any of these details. With the expected unreasonable jealousy of her sex, she immediately came to the conclusion that a woman had entered her, our house through some small opening in one of the walls. How did she get in here? she demanded. You promised me all the holes in the roof had been fixed. They have been, I said. But why do you assume the stranger is a woman? With my power of sight recognition, I... She interrupted me with, Oh, I don't care about your sight recognition. Feeling is believing, and a straight line to the touch is worth a circle to the sight. These were both popular sayings among the frailer sex in Flatland. I didn't want to make her angry, so I said placatingly, Well, if you're sure, then introduce yourself. Using her most polite manner, my wife advanced forward, saying, as she reached the stranger, Permit me, madam, to feel and be felt by... Then she jumped back suddenly, exclaiming, Oh, it's not a woman, and I can't feel a single angle, not even a hint of one. Is it possible you are a perfect circle, and that I've dishonored you by daring to feel you? <clears throat> the voice replied, In a certain sense of the word, you are right to call me a circle, since I am much closer to being a perfect circle than any circle of flatland, but it would be more accurate to say that I am many circles in one. Then he said, in a more formal tone, I have a message, dear madam, for your husband, which is for his ears alone. If it's not too much trouble, would you allow him and I to leave the room for a few minutes? We... But my wife didn't let even let him finish his proposal before she was showing herself out the door instead of allowing us to leave, refusing to allow such an important guest to have to inconvenience himself on her behalf, saying that she should have gone to bed herself long ago, and apologizing repeatedly the entire time as she backed into her own apartment, humming her peace cry as she went. I glanced at the half-hourglass. The last sands had fallen. The third millennium had begun. Note from the second editor. No, I do not know how all of the events above managed to happen in an entire hour, half hour, since the author reset the hourglass. The world may never know. End of second editor's note. <clears throat> I'm getting a drink quick. Section 16. How the Stranger Vainly Endeavored to Reveal to Me in Words the Mysteries of Spaceland As soon as the receding peace cry of my wife had died away, I tried to approach the stranger myself to get a closer look at him. I wanted to invite him to be seated, but his appearance was so astonishing that I found myself unable to move or speak. Despite not having a single angle that I could see, every moment I looked at him, he seemed to change right in front of my eyes, changing from different brightnesses and sizes in a way I'd never imagined possible. The thought suddenly crossed my mind that the figure in front of me could be a burglar or a murderer, some monstrous irregular isosceles, who had faked the voice of a circle to get past my servants into the house, and was now about to stab me with his invisibly sharp point. <coughs> In a dry living room with no fog to help me discern angles, and at such short range, sight recognition wasn't something I could trust. Desperate with fear, I suddenly regained my ability to move and rush forward, blurting out an unceremonious, You must permit me, sir. I didn't even bother finishing the phrase before I felt him with my side. My wife was right. There were no angles at all, and not even the smallest, ru smallest roughness or texture. Never in my entire life had I met a more perfect circle. He stood still while I walked completely around him, starting at his eye and s circling back to it again. Circular he was, all the way around. Perfectly circular. There could be no doubt about it. This was followed by a conversation which I will do my best to write down as clearly as I can remember, leaving out only a few of my many apologies, because I was so humiliated and ashamed of the idea that I, a common square, had dared to touch and feel a perfect circle. 
This conversation was started by the stranger, who finally got impatient with me. The conversation went like this. The stranger. Haven't you felt enough? Isn't it time we move past the introductions already? Me. Please forgive me, most esteemed sir. I'm normally so much more prepared for these kind of visits, but I wasn't expecting such an important guest to appear so late at night without warning, and my nervousness got the better of me. I beg you not to tell anyone else how rude I've been, especially not my wife. But before we say anything... <coughs> <coughs> But before we say anything else, can I ask where you are visiting from? The stranger. From space. From space, sir. Where else? Me. Pardon me, my lord, but aren't we in space right now? The stranger. Pooh. What do you know about space? This fine space. Me. My lord, space is heightened width, stretching on forever. The stranger. See, you don't even know what space is. You think it's only two dimensions, but I've come to tell you about a third. Space is height, width, and length. Me. Then you will be pleased to know that we have a fourth name for the two dimensions, too. Sometimes we say thickness instead of width, the way you words use the word length to mean height. The stranger. I don't mean three different names, I mean three different dimensions. Me. Would your lordship please show or explain to me what direction this third dimension is in? The stranger. It's where I came from. It's above you and below you. Me. So you mean it's to the north and south? The stranger. I mean no such thing. I'm talking about directions you can't look in because you don't have an eye on your inside. Because you don't have an eye on your side. Me. Pardon me, my lord, but if you look at me, you'll see that I have a perfectly good eye at the point formed by two of my sides. The stranger. Yes, but to see into space, you would need to have an eye on your side, not your perimeter. I mean, you would probably call it your insides, but in spaceland, we would call that your side. Me. An eye on my insides? An eye in my stomach? You're joking with me. The stranger. I am not in a joking mood. I am telling you I came from space, but since you don't understand what space actually means, we'll call it the land of three dimensions. Just a little while ago, I was looking down at your flat plane, which you mistakenly call space, and from up there I saw everything that you think of as solid, which to you just means enclosed on the sides. I saw into all your flat houses, your churches, your safes and drawers, and yes, even into your insides and stomachs, all of it lying there out in the open for me to see. Me. It's very easy to say things like that, my lord. The stranger. Meaning you won't believe me without proof. Well, here's your proof. When I came down here, I saw your four pentagon sons, each sleeping in his own room. I saw your two hexagon grandsons, the youngest of which was with you for a while before he went to bed, leaving only you and your wife in the living room. I saw your three isosceles servants eating their supper in the kitchen and the little errand boy in the laundry room. And then I came here. How do you think I got in? Me. Through a hole in the roof, I assume. The stranger. Wrong. You know very well that your roof was just re recently repaired, and the walls are so solid that not even a woman could find a crack to fit through. I'm telling you again, I'm from space. Isn't what I've just told you proof of that? Me. Your lordship must know how easy it would be to learn what you just told me, just from asking my neighbors. It wouldn't be difficult, especially for someone of your status. The stranger, muttering to himself, What else can I try? Wait, I've got an idea that might work. <clears throat> the stranger, to me. When you see a straight line, your wife, for example, how many dimensions do you think she takes up? Me. Ah, your lordship is confusing me for one of the common rabble who doesn't understand mathematics at all and thinks that a woman is, is literally a straight line who only exists in a single dimension. No, no, my lord, I assure you, we sca squares are better educated than that. We know as just as well as you do that a woman, though she is commonly called a straight line, is scientifically just a very thin parallelogram, taking up the dimensions of both length and width, or thickness, if you want to call it that, just like the rest of us. The stranger. But just the fact that a line is visible tells you that it has a third dimension. Me. My lord, I just said that we know a woman has both length and width. We see her length, and we infer her width. Even though it is very small, it can be measured. The stranger. 
You don't understand what I'm trying to say. I mean that when you see a woman, you see her length, and you infer her width, but you also see what we call her height, though with your country, that's not very high at all. If a line seen from the side had nothing except length without height, it would cease to exist and be completely invisible. Surely you understand this. Me. I have to confess that you're right, and I don't understand you at all, your lordship. Your lordship. When we in Flatland see a line, we see length and brightness. If the brightness disappears, the line is destroyed and, as you put it, no longer occupies space. But am I understanding you right that you've decided that brightness is a dimension and what I call bright you call high? The stranger. No, that's not right. By height, I mean a dimension like your length, but with you, height is hard to measure because of how incredibly small it is. Me. My lord, this can easily be tested. <clears throat> you say I have a third dimension, which you call height. Now, dimension implies both direction and measurement, so just measure my height, or just show me which way my height extends, and you can consider me a true believer. But even if you can't do this, then you'll... But if even you can't do this, then you'll just have to excuse me for being ignorant myself. The stranger to himself. I can't do either of those things. How can I convince him? Surely a simple statement of the facts, followed by a visual demonstration, ought to work. The stranger to me. Now listen, sir. You are living on a plane. What you call flatland is the vast surface of what I would call a fluid. You and your countrymen move or may... <clears throat> you and your countryman move on, or maybe in the top of it, without floating above or sinking below. The Stranger I am not a plain figure like you, I am a solid. You call me a circle, but I'm not actually a circle. You could say I'm an infinite number of circles, all placed one on top of the other, ranging in size from a single point at the smallest to a circle of thirteen inches in diameter at the largest. When I float inside your plane like I am doing right now, the only part of me that exists in your plane is a section that you correctly think of as a circle. The only way you flatlanders will ever be able to see a sphere in flatland is as a circle. A sphere, by the way, is the proper name for my shape where I come from. Don't you remember the dream you had last night? I saw it. I can see everything in flatland from up in space, and I saw the dream written on your brain. Don't you remember how you entered the realm of Lineland? And surely only... <clears throat> And the only way the king could make sense of you was as a line, not a square, because the linear realm didn't have enough dimensions to represent all of you at the same time. You could only exist in Lineland as small slices of yourself, one at a time. It's exactly the same way with myself and your flatland. Your country of only two dimensions isn't enough to let all of me exist here at once, so you can only see a single section of me at any time. And this is why you see me as a circle even though I am a three-dimensional sphere. The brightness of your eye has dimmed, which means you still don't believe me. But get ready to see the proof of what I say. It's true that you can't see more... <coughs> it's true that you can't see more than one of my circular sections at a time, since you can't lift your eye out of the plane of flatland, but you can at least watch how my sections become smaller as I lift myself out of flatland. Watch. I will rise above you, and you will see that my circle will become smaller and smaller, until it is nothing but a point, and then vanishes completely. <clears throat> Image description start. A black and white diagram showing a sphere intersecting a line, with an eye on the right corner of this line labeled my eye. At first the sphere rests with the line intersecting, intersecting the middle of his body, creating a large circle. This is labeled the sphere with this section at full size. Then we are shown the sphere rising, with the line now in a lower section creating a smaller circle. Finally, the sphere is almost above the line completely, forming a tiny circle labeled the sphere on the limit of vanishing. Image description end. <coughs> There was no rising, at least not as far, at least not that I could see, but he did get increasingly smaller until he disappeared. I blinked once or twice to make sure I wasn't dreaming again, but it wasn't a dream. From the depths of nowhere, seeming to come from close to my heart, I heard a hollow voice ask, You see how I disappeared? Do you believe me yet? 
Well, keep watching, and I'll slowly return to Flatland, and you'll see my section become larger and larger. Every reader in Spaceland will easily understand that my mysterious guest was speaking the simple truth. But to me, even though I was well-trained in Flatland mathematics, this was a very difficult concept to grasp. The diagram I have provided above will make it clear to any Spaceland child that the sphere, moving upwards in the three positions indicated, obviously would have appeared to me, or any other Flatlander, as only a circle that was becoming smaller and smaller until he was nothing but a point before vanishing. <clears throat> but even though I had all of the evidence in front of me, the reasons for it were just as confusing and unbelievable as ever. The only thing I could comprehend was that the circle had somehow made himself smaller until he vanished, and now he was making himself reappear and grow larger again. When he regained his largest size, he let out a deep sigh, because it was obvious from my silence that I still didn't believe or understand him. And to tell you the truth, I was now starting to believe that maybe he wasn't a circle at all, but some kind of entertainer, maybe a juggler. It was either that, or all the old wives' tales were true, and enchanters and magicians were real. <clears throat> After a long pause, the stranger muttered to himself, One option is left if I'm going to avoid drastic action. I'll have to try explaining using an analogy. Then he was silent for an even longer time until he started speaking again, continuing our dialogue. Sphere, tell me, Mr. Mr. Mathematician, if a point moving north... Hold on, let me get a drink. <clears throat> tell me, Mr. Mathematician, if a point moved northward and left a trail of light... What name would you give this trail? Me. A straight line. Sphere. And a straight line has how many terminal points? Me. Two. Sphere. Now imagine that line moving parallel to itself, to east or west, so that each terminal point leaves behind it a light trail in a straight line. What do you call this shape? Let's assume that the line has moved a distance equal to its own original length. What do you call this figure, I ask you? Me. A square. Sphere. And how many sides does a square have? How many angles or points? Me. Four sides and four angles. <clears throat> sphere. Now, stretch your imagination a little and imagine this flatland sphere moving parallel to itself by moving upward. Me. What? Northward. Sphere. No, not northward. Upward. Out of flatland altogether. If it moved northward, the southern points would have to move to the spots where the northern points had started out, but that's not what I mean. I mean every point in you, since you're a square, I'll use your shape to illustrate my point. Every point in you, and what you call your insides, needs to move upward, through space, in a way so that no point touches a spot where another point started out. Each point will create a new straight line of its own. All of this follows the rule of analogy. Surely you understand now. <clears throat> <clears throat> Restraining my impatience, since I was now very tempted to rush blindly at my visitor and shove him into space, or out of flatland, or anywhere really, as long as I could get rid of him, I replied, And this figure that I'm supposed to be creating by moving it in the direction you are pleased to call upward, what is it like? I assume you'll be able to describe it to me in the language of flatland. Sphere. Oh, certainly. It's all very simple and strictly follows the analogy. But, by the way, you shouldn't call the result a figure. It's not a figure, it's a solid. But I'll describe it to you, or rather, I'll describe it using an analogy. We begin with just a single point, which obviously is made up of one single terminal point. One point then becomes a line with two terminal points. One line becomes a square with four terminal points. Now you can answer your own question. One, two, four. The geometrical progression is obvious. What number comes next? Me. Eight. Sphere. Exactly. The square produces a solid that you do not have a name for, but we call a cube, with eight terminal points. Now do you believe me? Me. So, does this creature have sides as well as angles, which you call terminal points? Sphere. Of course. 
and all according to analogy. But, by the way, I don't mean what you call sides, which we sometimes call edges. It would have what we call sides, which you call solids. <clears throat> Image description start. A black and white diagram showing a square, then a cube. One of the lines on the square has two arrows pointing to it, labeling it a flatland side, what Spacelanders call an edge. Then one of the flat surfaces on the cube is labeled a Spaceland side, what Flatlanders call a solid. Image description end. Me. And how many solids or sides will this being that you call a cube have when I am done creating him by somehow moving my inside in an upward direction? Sphere. How can you ask that and still call yourself a mathematician? The side of the thing is always doubled with the increase of the dimension. A point has no dimensions, so it has zero sides. Next we have a line whose points we will consider sides for this theory, which, of it, which it has two of. Next is a square with four sides. We go from 0 to 2 to 4. 0 to 4. We go from 0 to 2 to 4. 0 to 4. What kind of pattern do you call that? Me. A mathematical one. Sphere. And what is the next number in that pattern? Me. 6. Sphere. Exactly. See? You've answered your own question. The cube will have six sides, or what you call your insides. You understand it now, you understand it all now, eh? <clears throat> A note from the second editor. I have chosen to present the next section of dialogue by the author in both his original phrasings, as well as my translation into more casual language, because I think the original is very funny, and I don't want to deprive my readers of the joy of experiencing it. End of second editor's note. Translation. Monster, I shrieked. I don't care if you're a juggler, an enchanter, a dream, or a demon. I won't tolerate your jokes anymore. Either you'll die, or I will. Original. Monster, I shrieked. Be thou juggler, enchanter, dream, or devil. No more will I endure thy mockeries. Either thou or I must perish. And with these words, I charged him. <clears throat> Section 17. How the sphere, having in vain tried words, resorted to deeds. It was no use. I used my strongest right angle to ram him violently in the side, with enough speed and force that I would have killed any normal circle. But I could feel him escaping me, not by moving to the right or to the left, but somehow moving out of the world, vanishing into thin air. Soon there was nothing left to see or feel. But I still heard the intruder's voice. Sphere. Why won't you listen to reason? I'd hope that you, a man of education and a skilled mathematician, would become my advocate, an apostle for the truth of the three dimensions, which I am only allowed to reveal once in a thousand years. But I don't know how to convince you. Wait. I have it. Actions, not words, will show you the truth. Listen, my friend. I've already told you that from my position in space above you, I can see inside all of the things that you consider closed or solid. For example, I see in the... I see in the cupboard near you some of what you call boxes, though with you they have no tops or bottoms, and these boxes are filled with money. I can also see two account books. I am about to move down into that cupboard, and I will bring you one of those books. I saw you lock the cupboard half an hour ago, and you still have the key with you. But I don't need a key, I am coming down from space itself. Look, the doors aren't touched at all. Now I am inside the cupboard, and I am picking up the book. I have it now. And I'm lifting it back, and I'm lifting back up with it. I rushed to the cupboard, unlocked it, and threw the door open. One of the books was gone. With a mocking laugh, the stranger appeared in the far corner of the room, and at the same time, the book appeared on the floor in front of him. I ran to grab it, and there was no doubt in my mind. It was the same book that had just disappeared from the cupboard. I groaned with horror, wondering if I'd gone insane. <clears throat> But the stranger just continued, Surely, you see, now that I'm telling the truth, there's no other explanation. What you call solid things aren't solid at all, and what you call the whole of space is just a big flat plane. I am in space and I look down on the insides of all the things you will only ever see the outsides of. 
You could leave this plane yourself if you would just put in enough effort. A tiny movement upwards or downwards would let you see everything I can see. The higher I go, the further from your plane I get, and the more I can see, although obviously gets smaller with distance. For example, right now I am moving upward, and I can see your neighbor, the hexagon, and his family as they sleep in their rooms. His voice was slightly fainter as he continued, Now I'm even higher, and I can see the theater, just ten houses away, and on the other side of that is a circle in his study room, sitting with his books. Then his voice got clearer as he said, now I'll come back down to you. And as the final proof, what if I give you a touch, just a gentle touch, in your stomach? It wouldn't, it shouldn't seriously injure you, and a little bit of pain you might feel will be far outweighed by the mental benefit you'll get from it. Before I could object, I felt a shooting agony of pain inside of me, and heard a demon demoniacal laugh that seemed to come from the same place. After a moment, the sharp agony lessened, leaving only a dull ache behind, and the stranger began to reappear, saying as he increased in size, There, that didn't hurt too much, did it? If that didn't convince you, I don't know what will. Well, are you convinced? <clears throat> I made a rev resolution. I was not going to put up with any more random pranks from a magician who could somehow play tricks with my very own stomach. Maybe I could pin him to the wall until help came. I began to shout for help from my family, while I did my best to slam into him with my hardest angle again. I think looking back that the stranger sank partially below our plane right as I began charging at him, and then he found it really difficult to get back up to the surface again, so that only a small top section was visible to me. In any case, he stayed still while I continued to shout for my family and pressed him against, and pressed against him with all my strength, thinking I'd heard someone coming to help. A shudder ran through the sphere, and I heard him say in a muffled voice, This cannot be! Either he has to listen to me, or I have to resort to the last option left to me. Then he raised his voice, speaking to me hurriedly, speaking to me, hurrying to exclaim, Listen! No one but you can be allowed to see what you've seen. Send your wife back to her room immediately before she sees this. The truth of three dimensions cannot be ruined like this. Not after a thousand years of waiting. It can't all be thrown away now. I can hear her coming. Get back! Back! Either let me go or come with me into a land you do not know. Into the land of three dimensions. Fool! Madman! Irregular! I shouted. I'll never let you go. You'll pay for your crimes against me. <clears throat> "'Has it really come to this?' the stranger thundered. "'Ha! Then meet your fate. Out of your plane you go. Once, twice, thrice. Here we go!' <clears throat> Hi, pretty kid. <clears throat> Section 18 how I came to Spaceland, and what I saw there. An unspeakable, horrifying sensation gripped me. There was darkness, and then a dizzy, sickening version of sight that wasn't like any sight I knew. I saw a line that wasn't a line. I saw space that wasn't space. I was myself, but I wasn't myself anymore. I closed my eye to make it stop, and when I finally found my voice, I shrieked in agony. This is either insanity or hell! It's neither, said the voice of the sphere, or, <clears throat> it's neither, the voice of the sphere, sphere replied calmly. It is knowledge. It is the three dimensions. Calm down, open your eye, and try looking again. I opened my eye again and looked and saw a new world. There, in front of me, in a way I'd never seen it before, was everything that I'd ever inferred, guessed, and dreamed of, in perfect circular beauty. I could see the entirety of the stranger right in front of me. What I would have called his inside was now visible to me, but I couldn't <coughs> <coughs> sorry. But I couldn't see his heart, lungs, arteries, or anything else. Only a beautiful, otherworldly something that I had no name for, but which you, my readers in Spaceland, would call the surface of the sphere. I did Hold on, cat's knocking things down. <clears throat> I did the flatland equivalent of what Spacelanders would call bowing down or getting on my knees in front of my teacher and cried, Please tell me, oh most perfectly beautiful and 
O oh, most perfectly wise and beautiful one, why can I see your inside, but not your heart, lungs, arteries, or liver? You're not actually seeing my inside, he replied with a bit of annoyance. Neither you nor anyone else can see my insides, because I am of a higher order than the beings of Flatland. If I were just a circle, you would be able to see my insides just as easily as I can see yours, but I am not a circle. But I am not just a circle. I am many circles, the many in the one, which we call a sphere. Just like the outer surfaces of a cube are squares, my surface appears as a circle. <clears throat> Though I had no idea what he was saying, I had stopped being annoyed by that, by that, and now felt only adoring worship for him. He continued in a more gentle tone, Don't be too upset if you can't immediately understand all of the mysteries of Spaceland. You'll get the hang of it as we go. For now, come back with me to the plain of Flatland, and I'll show you everything you thought you were familiar with through math and imagination, but from a new angle that will let you actually see it all from above. That's impossible, I cried, but the sphere was already leading the way, and I followed, as easily as if this were a dream. Look down there, he said, and see your own pentagonal house, and everyone in it. I looked, and I saw with my own eye all the details of my house that I'd known existed through the sense of feeling, and inferring from angles, but had never really seen. And how pitiful was the way I'd imagined it all before, in comparison to the beautiful reality I now saw in front of me. My four sons were calmly sleeping in their northwestern rooms, my two grandsons to the south, the servants, the butler, and my daughter, all in their own apartments. The little serving boy, the page, had left his room, too, and, pretending to think that I'd fainted somewhere, was trying to break into the locked cabinet in my study room. Only my wife, alarmed by my sudden shouting and just as abrupt disappearance, had left her room and was actually looking for me, pacing up and down the hall, clearly anxious for me to come back. I could see all of this, with my real eye, not just in my imagination, and as we got closer and closer I could see even more details, including what was inside my cabinet, the two chests of gold and the one book that the sphere hadn't removed. <coughs> Image description start. A black and white diagram showing the Pentagon house described above, with a compass in one corner showing the house points north. In the main room of the house is a straight line labeled my wife, while everyone else is asleep in their own rooms except for the page who is in the study. Image description end. Not wanting to see my wife so upset, I would have jumped back down to reassure her, but when I tried to move to do just that, I found myself stuck in place. Don't worry about your wife, my teacher said. She'll only be worried for a little while. For now, let's look at Flatland some more. <clears throat> Once again, I felt myself being grabbed and lifted through space, and the result was exactly what the sphere had said it would be. The further away we were from what we were looking at, the more we could see at once. My home city, with the inside of every single building and creature inside it, lay before me in miniature. Then we went. <clears throat> then we went even higher, and the secrets of the earth, the depths of mines, caverns, and hills, were revealed to me. Awestruck by the idea that the secrets of the earth itself were being revealed to me, a simple square, I said to my companion, I have become a god! The wise men in my country have always said that to see all things, which they call omnividence, is a power only a god can have. <clears throat> One second. There was something like scorn in my teacher's voice as he answered me with, Oh, is that so? Then even the most criminal thieves and murderers from my country should be worshipped by your wise men as gods, because each of them can see as much as you do right now. But trust me, your wise men are wrong. Me. Then is omnividence a power also given to those who aren't gods? Sphere. I don't know, but if a thief or murderer from my country can see everything in your country, obviously that's not a good enough reason to accept them as a god. This omnividence, as you call it, does it make you more understanding, more merciful, less selfish, more loving? It doesn't. So how does it make you more divine? Me. 
more merciful and loving. These are the traits of women, and we know that a circle is better is a better being than a straight line. We know that knowledge and wisdom are more important than love. Sphere, it's not my job to tell you. <clears throat> It's not my job to tell you that one type of person is better than another, but many of the best and brightest in space, Spaceland think that kindness and love are more important than knowledge. They are more like straight lines you despise than the circles you worship. But enough of this. Look over there. Do you recognize that building? I looked off. I looked, and far off I saw an immense polygonal building, which I recognized as the General Assembly Hall of the States of Flatland, surrounded by rows of pentagonal buildings with streets cutting through them at right angles. We were going to the great city, the metropolis. <clears throat> we will go down again here, my teacher said when we arrived. It was now morning, the first hour of the first day of the year 2000. Strictly sticking to tradition, the highest circles of the world were holding an important and serious assembly, just like their ancestors had on the first day of the year 1000, and before that on the year zero. The decisions of those earlier meetings were now being read to the council by a man I immediately recognized as my brother, a perfectly symmetrical square who was the chief scribe of the high council. He read the summary of the first meetings out loud. Because of the history of troublemakers and riots forming on this holiday from liars who pretend to have met visitors from another world, it has been unanimously decided that on each of the that on the first day of each new thousandth year, special orders will be given to the leaders of every country in Flatland to start a search for any of these liars and heretics. If found, there will be no excuses made for them, and no measurements will be taken. The punishment for this crime will depend on the criminal shape. Any isosceles will be killed at once. Any equilateral triangle will be whipped and imprisoned. Any square or pentagon will be sent to the district's insane asylum. Anyone of higher rank will be arrested and brought to the capital immediately to be interviewed and judged by this council. Do you all agree with this ruling? <clears throat> <clears throat> that is your fate, the sphere said to me while the council was agreeing to pass the law for the third time. Death or imprisonment are what await the speaker of the truth of the three dimensions. Not necessarily, I said. It seems so clear to me that I think I could make even a, that I think I th It seems so clear to me that I think I could even make a child understand it now. Just let me go down there and I'll explain it to them. <coughs> hey, don't hold on. Cat's causing problems. Don't scratch that. <clears throat> Not yet, my teacher said. You will re your turn will come later. For now, I have to do my part. Wait here. With these words, he leapt agilely down into the sea, as it appeared from above, a flatland, and landed right in the middle of the ring of council members. I am here, he shouted, to tell you that there is a land of three dimensions. I watched many of the younger councillors jump away in obvious horror as the sphere's circular section seemed to expand in front of them. But the president's... <clears throat> But the president circle of the council didn't seem surprised or afraid at all, and simply gave a signal that summoned six very low-ranking isosceles from different corners of the room, who immediately rushed upon the sphere. "'We have him!' cried one. Then another said, "'No!' Then, "'Yes, we have him!' Then, "'No, he's going! He's gone!' as my teacher lifted himself back out of flatland. My lords, said the president to the younger and lower-ranked circles of the council, do not be alarmed. The secret archives that only I have access to tell me that the same thing has happened during the starts of the last two millennium as well. Obviously, don't say anything about this to anyone outside this council. <clears throat> then he raised his voice and summoned the presidential guards. Arrest the isosceles and gag them, he said. You know your duty. The isosceles had been unlucky enough to witness a state secret that they couldn't be allowed to reveal, so they would be killed to keep them quiet. After they were led away, the president spoke to the councillors again. My lords, our meeting here is over, so the only thing I have left to do is to wish you a happy new year. The others left the room, 
but before the president left he told the scribe my perfectly configured but unlucky brother how sorry he was but he was going to have to spend the rest of his life in prison but the president assured him cheerfully as long as he promised to keep the secret he wouldn't be killed <coughs> Section 19. How, though the sphere showed me other mysteries of Spaceland, I still desired more, and what came of it. When I watched my poor brother be led away to imprisonment, I attempted to leap down into the council chamber, either to rescue him, or at least to say goodbye, but like before, I couldn't move. Somehow my teacher was holding me in place. He said to me, sadly, Don't worry about your brother. If you're lucky, you'll soon have all the time in the world to speak with him. Follow me. Once more, we lifted up into space. So far, said the sphere, I've only shown you plain or flat figures and their insides. Now I have to teach you about solids or three-dimensional shapes and explain to you how we are constructed. Here I have a deck of square cards. Watch. I put one on another, and not northward like you assumed, but on top of it. Now I do the same with a second and a third card. You see? I am building up a solid by placing multiple squares parallel to each other. This is the last card, so now this solid is complete, and it is as high as it is long and wide, so we call it a cube. <coughs> right, let me shift. Let's see. <coughs> Pardon me, my lord, I replied, but to me it just looks like an irregular figure whose inside faces me. I mean, I don't think I'm seeing a solid but a flat shape like we imagine in Flatland, but so irregular that it makes me think it's some monstrous criminal to the point that I'm afraid just to look at it. The sphere said, To you it appears as a plain figure because you're not used to, shade, to light, shade, and perspective yet, the same way that in Flatland... Someone who does not know the art of sight recognition would see only a straight line when they look at a hexagon. But it is a solid, as you'll see through the sense of feeling. <clears throat> Image description start. A grayscale diagram showing two cubes. The first has horizontal lines drawn on each face and dotted lines on the inside to show the perspective and has a label explaining a spacelander can recognize shading and perspective to understand that a 3D shape is made of multiple surfaces. The second cube has a whole inside has the whole inside scribbled in, making it appear, appear more like a slightly stretched out hexagon than a cube and is labeled a flatlander who does not understand the meaning of perspective or shading will see the 3D object as only a single flat surface. Image description end. <clears throat> then he had me feel the cube, and I found that he was telling the truth. This amazing, amazing, cre this amazing creation wasn't a plane at all, but a solid, and it was blessed with six plane sides and eight terminal points called solid angles. And I remembered what the sphere had told me, that this shape was created by moving a square parallel to itself through space, and I felt joy at the thought that a creature as insignificant as insignificant as I could, in some way, be called the ancestor of such a remarkable descendant. But I still couldn't fully understand what my teacher meant about- hold on, something is crawling on me. <clears throat> okay. I think it was a spider. But I still couldn't fully understand what my teacher meant by light and shade and perspective, so I didn't hesitate before ma asking for more information. I won't bore you with the details, because I know you Spacelanders are all already experts in it, but the summary is that th through very simple logical statements and changing the position of different objects and lights and letting me feel these objects and even his own sacred body, the sphere succeeded in teaching me the art of perspective, so that I could now easily tell the difference between a circle and a sphere and a plane figure and a solid. A note from the second editor. <clears throat> 
I would like to apologize to the author, despite the fact that he is long since dead, because I will have to also edit the following sections for my readers to more easily understand him, so his original wording will not remain intact. To see the author's original phrasings, please read Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions, 1884. This was the climax, the paradise, the peak of my strange and eventful life. From now on, <clears throat> I will have to tell you the story of my miserable fall. Miserable, but undeserved. Because why should those seeking knowledge be teased, only to be disappointed and punished? <laughs> oh my gosh. Sorry, my cat was rolling around and almost fell off a table. <laughs> Because why should those seeking knowledge be teased, only to be disappointed and punished? My mind shrinks from the painful task of telling you how I was, I was humiliated, but, like a second Prometheus, I will endure this, and worse, if it has a chance of lighting a spark of rebellion in the hearts of plain and solid humanity, against the idea that we should limit our understanding of the dimensions as being two, or as only being two, or three, or anything less than infinity itself. I will throw away all my personal feelings. Let me continue my story to the end without any further distractions or pauses and just tell you the plain facts of history. The exact facts, the exact words, they are burnt into my brain and I will set them down <clears throat> without a single change to them and let my readers be the judge of me and my destiny. The sphere would have been happy to continue his lessons by teaching me about the conformation or structure of all common solids, cylinders, cones, pyramids, pentahedrons, hexahedrons, dodecahedrons, and spheres, but I decided to interrupt him. <clears throat> Not because I was bored with his teachings, on the contrary, I wanted even more than he was offering me. Pardon me, I said formally. Oh, you whom I must no longer call the perfection of all beauty, please, I beg you, let your humble servant have the blessing of a sight of your insides. The sphere. My what? Me. Your insides. Your stomach. Intestines. The sphere. Where did this suddenly come from? And what do you mean I'm no longer the perfection of all beauty? Me. My lord, your own wisdom has taught me to look forward to a teacher even more great, even more beautiful and close to perfection than yourself. As you are superior to all flatland forms, combining many circles into one, I have no doubt that there is another above you who combines many spheres into one supreme existence, going above and beyond even the solids of spaceland. And just as we are in space looking down on flatland and can see the inside of all things, I am certain that above us there is even higher, purer region, where you intend to lead me next, O oh, you whom I will always call, everywhere and in any dimension, my priest, philosopher, and friend. Whoops. How did I manage that typo? <clears throat> You plan to bring me to some more spacious space, some more dimensionable dimensionality, where we will look down together on the revealed insides of solid things, and where your own intestines and those of other spheres will lie as exposed to the view of this poor wandering exile from Flatland, who has already been blessed to learn so much. The Sphere. Pooh! Ridiculous! Enough of this nonsense! We are running out of time, and there's still a lot you have to learn before you're ready to teach the truth of the three dimensions to your ignorant countrymen in Flatland. Me. No, teacher, please don't say no to what I know is in your power to give me. Let me have just one glimpse of your insides, and I will never ask for anything else. I will be your perfect and silent student, your forever slave, ready to learn everything you have to teach me without interruption. The Sphere. Well, then, to get you to be quiet, I'll say once and for all that if I could show you, I would, but I can't. You can't really expect me to turn my stomach inside out for you, can you? <clears throat> me. But my lord has shown me the intestines of all my countrymen in the land of two dimensions by bringing me into the land of three. How can it be any more difficult to bring me to the region of the fourth dimension, where I'll be able to look down and see the inside of every three-dimensional house, the very minds inside the solid earth, and the intestines of every living, solid creature, including the noble and blessed spheres? The Sphere 
But where is this land of four dimensions? Me. I don't know, but I'm sure you do. The Sphere. I don't. There is no such place. The very idea of it is completely ridiculous. It's inconceivable. <clears throat> me. Not inconceivable, my lord. My lord. Not to me. So surely you must understand it as my teacher. No, I, I'm sure you know. I know my lord will be able to use his arts to explain the fourth dimension to me, just like how you explained the existence of the invisible third dimension to me while I was in Flatland, even though I couldn't see it yet. Let me go back to what you said before. Didn't you teach me that when I saw a line and inferred a plane, I was really seeing a third dimension, separate from brightness, called height, without realizing it? Doesn't logic state that... <clears throat> Doesn't logic then state that, in this region, when I see a plane and infer a solid, I am also seeing a fourth dimension I cannot recognize, which is separate from color but still exists, though in a way we cannot think to measure? And let's not forget that we have the proof of, an, proof of the analogy of figures, too. The Sphere. Analogy? Nonsense! What analogy? Me. Your lordship is testing me to see whether I have been paying attention, but please don't waste time like this, my lord. I want, I need more knowledge. Most, <clears throat> how? Most likely we cannot see that higher space. Most likely we cannot see that. Yeah. Most likely we cannot see that higher space land right now because we have no eye in our stomachs. But the land of three dimensions. But the land of three dimensions still existed even in Lineland, though that poor monarch couldn't turn either way to see it, and existed in Flatland too, even though I, blind and senseless wretch, had no ability to see or touch it. So I am sure that there is a fourth dimension, which my lord sees with the inner eye of thought. It must exist because of everything my lord has taught me, or has he forgotten what he himself taught his servant? In one dimension, doesn't a moving point create a line with two terminal points? In two dimensions, doesn't a line, doesn't a moving line create a square with four terminal points? And here in three dimensions, didn't moving, a, didn't a moving square create, in front of my own eye, a cube, such a blessed being, with eight terminal points? And in four dimensions, doesn't it follow that a cube moving would create an even more divine shape with sixteen terminal points? It will be a tragedy for analogy and the progress of truth it is, if it is not so. Look at the unquestionable pattern of the series, 2, 4, 8, 16. Isn't this a clear geometrical progression? Isn't this, if I can quote my lord's own words, strictly according to analogy? Again, didn't you teach me yourself, my lord, that it, in a line there are two outer points, and in a square there are four outer lines, and in a cube there are six outer squares? The pattern is here again, 2, 4, 6. Isn't this an arithmetic? Arithmetic, arithmetical, an arithmetical progression? Doesn't logic say that the more divine offspring of the cube in this land of four dimensions will have eight outer cubes, and isn't this, as you have taught me to believe, strictly according to analogy? Oh my lord, my lord, I do not know if what I say is true, but I trust to my faith that it might be, and I beg your lordship to tell me if my logic is right or wrong. If I'm wrong, I will give up the idea of the fourth dimension forever, but if I'm right, my lord, my lord must listen to reason. So I ask you, is it or is it not true that before now, your countrymen have also witnessed the appearance of beings from a higher reality than their own, entering closed rooms, just as you entered mine, without opening any door or window, and seeming to vanish at will? I will bet everything on the answer to this question. Tell me I'm wrong, that it's not true, and I will never speak of it again. But please, give me an answer. The Sphere, after a pause. There have been reports of such things, but no one can agree on what the facts are, and even when we look at the facts, the witnesses explain them in different ways. And no matter how many witnesses there have been, no one has ever suggested that these visitors, that these visitors might be from the fourth dimension, so please stop these foolish questions and let's get back to business. Me. I was so sure of it! I was sure I was right! But please, just have a little patience and answer me just one more question. You, who are the best teacher in the world! Those who have appeared from nowhere and gone away again back to nowhere, 
Didn't their sections also seem to grow and shrink as they vanished into the more spacious space where I am asking you to take me? <clears throat> the sphere, moodily. They vanished for sure if they ever existed at all, but most people say that these visitors were only created by the witnesses' disturbed imagination. Me. Do they say that? Oh, please don't believe them. Or if it is true, then that means that this other reality, that this other space is really Thoughtland, and I beg you to take me there, to that blessed region where I will see the insides of all solid things. There, in front of my delighted eye, I will watch a cube, in strict accordance with analogy, move in some new direction I don't have a name for, and he will create an even more perfect shape than himself, a form with sixteen terminal extra-solid angles, and eight solid cubes for his outer perimeter. And why stop there? Should we stop in the doorway to the sixth dimension and refuse to enter? No! Let us resolve to keep going higher. Bowing to our quest for knowledge, the gates of the sixth dimension will fly open, and after that the seventh, and the eighth. How long I would have kept this up, I don't know. The sphere tried, in a thundering voice, to silence me many times, threatening me with harsh punishments if I didn't stop. But nothing could damn the river of my joyous, endless planning. Maybe he was right to punish me, but I was only reacting to the amazing truths that he himself had revealed to me. <clears throat> but it didn't take long for the end to come. My words were cut short by a crash that was both inside and outside of me at the same time, and it sent me flying through space so quickly I didn't have time to say anything else. Down, down, down. I was falling so quickly. <coughs> and I knew that returning to Flatland was to be my punishment. <clears throat> I got one last look when I will never forget of that colorless, flat world which was going to once again be my whole universe, spread out in front of my eye. Then everything was dark. Then there was an all-consuming roar of thunder, and when I came back to awareness, I was once again a common, pitifully crawling square in my study at home, hearing the peace cry of my approaching wife. Section 20 how the sphere encouraged me in a vision. <clears throat> I didn't have much time to think, but I knew instinctively I couldn't tell my wife what had happened. It wasn't that I thought in the moment that she would tell anyone, but I knew that to an un uneducated woman in Flatland, my adventure would be nothing more than absolute gibberish. So I tried to reassure her by telling her a story I made up on the spot about accidentally falling through the trapdoor and into the cellar, and lying there the whole night, stunned from the fall. The southward pull in our country was so weak that even to a woman, my story was ridiculous and almost impossible to believe. But my wife had more sense than was average for her sex, and she saw that I was more anxious and keyed up than usual. So she didn't argue with my story, she just told me that I seemed ill and should try to get some sleep. I was glad for the excuse to go to my room so I could think over what had happened. Once I was alone in my room, a wave of tiredness fell over me, but before I closed my eye, I tried to picture the third dimension again, and specifically the process that turned a square into a cube. <coughs> I couldn't remember it as clearly as I wanted to, but I did remember that it had to be upward but not northward. Whoops. I decided that I would memorize these words and use them as a reminder about the solution. So I repeated the words, upward, but not northward, to myself like a mantra until I fell into a deep and refreshing sleep. And while I slept, I had a dream. I dreamt that I was at the sphere's side again, and his bright glow told me that he was no longer angry. He had forgiven me completely. We were moving together towards a bright, but immeasurably small point, which my teacher directed my attention to. <clears throat> As we got closer, I started to hear what I thought was a slight humming noise, so quiet a fly's wings would be louder, and so quiet huh? oh. and so quiet, even in the perfect silence of the vacuum we flew through, that I didn't hear it until we stopped a very short distance away. <clears throat> 
Note from the second editor. The original measurement is written as something under 20 human diagonals. Unfortunately, I have no idea what he's talking about. End of second editor's note. Look there, said my teacher. This will be your final lesson in the dimensions. You've spent your life in flatland, you've received a vision of lineland, and you flew with me to the heights of spaceland. Now I have brought you down to the lowest depths of reality, to the realm of pointland, the abyss of zero dimensions. Look at the pathetic creature. That point is a being like us, but trapped in this zero-dimensional abyss. He is the whole of his entire world, his whole universe. He can't even imagine anything existing except himself. He doesn't have a concept of length or width or height, because he cannot experience them. He doesn't even know the number two, or even have the idea of more than one, because he is, himself, the only thing that exists here, and what exists here is nothing. But look at his perfect self-contentedness and learn the final lesson. It is always better to strive for knowledge than it is to be happy in ignorance. Now, listen. He stopped talking, and the tiny buzzing creature said in a quiet monotone similar to one of your Spaceland text-to-speech programs, Infinite beauty of existence. It is, and there is... <coughs> I don't know. Infinite beauty of existence, it is, and there is nothing else besides it. <clears throat> I asked, what does this puny creature mean by it? He means himself, said the sphere. Haven't you noticed that babies and baby-like people who cannot tell themselves apart from the world refer to themselves in the third person? But shush! It fills all space, the little creature said to himself. And what it fills, it is. What it thinks, it says. And what it says, it hears. And it is thinker, sayer, hearer, thought, word, and sound. It is the one and yet the all. Ah, the happiness, the happiness of being. I asked the sphere, Can't you startle this little thing out of its complacency? Tell it what it really is, like you told me? Reveal, reveal the narrow limits of pointland? And lead it up to a higher dimensions? And lead it up to the higher dimensions? That's not an easy task, my teacher said. You try. So I raised my voice to its loudest and addressed the point like this. Silence! Silence, you miserable creature! You call yourself all in all, but you're really just nothing. Your so-called universe is a mere speck in a line, and a line is a pale shadow compared with... Okay, okay, you've said enough, the sphere interrupted. Now listen and see how effective your insults were on the monarch of Pointland. The brilliance of the monarch glowed even brighter than before, showing it hadn't been upset at all, quite the contrary. The sphere had barely stopped talking before the point took up its voice again. Ah, the joy, the, ah, the joy of thought. What can't it achieve by thinking? Its own thought come to its, comes to itself, seeming to insult it, which makes, only makes it happier. Sweet rebellion that results in triumph. Ah, the divine creative power of the all-in-one. Ah, the joy, the joy of being. You see, my teacher said, how little effect your words had. As far as the monarch understood you at all, he accepted your words as his own, because he can't conceive of the idea that anyone besides himself exists. Now he praises himself on the novelty of its thought as a moment of creative power. Now let us leave this god of Pointland to the ignorant celebration of his supposed all-knowingness. There is nothing neither of us can do to rescue him from his prison of self-satisfaction. <clears throat> After this, we floated gently back up to Flatland, and I could hear the gentle voice of my companion and teacher repeating the final lesson again, that I should always aspire for more and inspire others to do the same. He confessed to me that he had been angry with me at first for my ambitions to soar beyond the third dimension, but since then he had received his own lessons, and he wasn't too proud to admit his, to his student when he was wrong. Then he began to teach me about the dimensions higher than the ones I had been allowed to witness, showing me how to construct four-dimensional extra solids by moving solids, and then fifth-dimensional extra, double extra solids by moving extra solids, and all of it strictly according to analogy, and all so simple, so easy, that the method would have been obvious even to the female sex. <clears throat> 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 
Section 21. How I tried to teach the theory of three dimensions to my grandson, and with what success. I awoke filled with joy, and began immediately thinking about the glorious future ahead of me. I would go forth, I thought, at once, and teach the whole of Flatland. Even the soldiers and women would be taught the truth of the three dimensions. I would begin with my wife. But just as I had decided on my plan of action, I heard the sound of many voices in the street outside, commanding silence. Then came a louder voice, a herald's proclamation. Listening closely, I recognized the words of the resolution of the High Council, demanding the arrest, imprisonment, or execution of anyone who dared to pollute the minds of the people with delusions of being, with the delusions of being given revelations from another world. I reflected. This was a danger I couldn't take lightly. <clears throat> Let me move quick. <clears throat> It would be better to avoid it by skipping straight to demonstrations rather than, than explanations, and after all, the thought of the demonstrations seemed so simple and conclusive that no harm would be done by dropping the words themselves. Upward, not northward, was the clue to the whole solution. It had seemed very clear to me before I fell asleep, and when I first woke up from my dream, it had seemed as logical as arithmetic. But somehow it didn't seem very obvious now. <clears throat> And though my wife conveniently entered my room just at that moment, I decided after we had exchanged a few words of small talk that I wouldn't begin with her after all. My Pentagon sons were men of good character and social standing, and doctors of good reputation, but not great when it came to mathematics, and that meant they weren't fit for my plans. But then it occurred to me that a young and pliable hexagon with a mathematical talent would make a very good student. <clears throat> So why not make the first test of demonstration for my intelligent little grandson, whose casual questions about the meaning of three cubed, though he only knew it as three to the third power, had earned him the approval of the sphere? Talking about it with him, a mere child, should be perfectly safe, because he wouldn't know anything about the proclamation of the council. Unlike my sons, who were such patriots and who cared little for blind affection and adored circles so much that I wasn't sure they wouldn't immediately hand me over to the prefect if they found me seriously. Hold on. <clears throat> Talking about it with him, a mere child, <coughs> should be perfectly safe because he wouldn't know anything about the proclamation of the council. Unlike my sons, who were such patriots, and cared little for blind affection, and adored the circles so much that I wasn't sure they wouldn't immediately hand me over to the prefect if they found me seriously preaching the heresy of the third dimension. But the first thing I needed to do was figure out a way to satisfy my wife's curiosity, who still thought of the sphere as a circle, and wanted, kn wanted to know why he... Wanted to know why he had wanted that mysterious private meeting with me, and how he had gotten into our house in the first place. Without getting into the details of the story I gave her, which... Uh-oh. Bye. Wait, hold on, let me... Okay, I don't have to end the recording. <clears throat> Where was I? Without getting into the details of the story I gave her, which wasn't as truthful as some of my readers in Spaceline might want, needless to say, I eventually succeeded in convincing her to quietly return to her household duties without further questions, all without revealing anything about the world of three dimensions to her. When this was done, I immediately sent for my grandson because, to tell you the truth, I felt like everything that I had seen and heard was, in some way, strange way, slipping away from me, like the image like images from a half-remembered, taunting dream, and I wanted to test my skill as soon as possible by taking on my first student. <clears throat> when my grandson entered the room, I carefully locked the door. Then, sitting down next to him and taking out our mathematical books, or as you might call them, lines, I told him we would pick up where we'd left off from the lesson from yesterday. I went over again how a point by moving in one dimension created a line, and how a straight line moving in two dimensions created a square. After this, I, for I forced a laugh and said, And now, you scamp, you wanted to make me believe that a sphere 
that a square could be moved the same way, upward, not northward, and create another figure, a sort of extra square in three dimensions. Say that again, you young rascal. But at that moment we heard the herald's cry of, Oh yes, oh yes, outside again, repeating the resolution of the council. My grandson was young, but he was unusually intelligent for his age, and had been raised with perfect respect for the authority of the circles. He understood the situation with a clarity I wasn't prepared for, and didn't speak a word until the proclamation had died away. <coughs> then he burst into tears and sobbed, Dear Grandpa, that was only silly fun. Of course I didn't mean it, and we didn't even know about the new law then. And I don't think I ever said anything about the third dimension, and I know I never said upward, not northward, since that would be ridiculous, you know? How could anything move upward but not northward? Upward but not northward, even if I were a little baby, I wouldn't believe anything as ridiculous as that. It's so silly, ha <laughs> I lost my temper. It's not silly at all, I said. Here, watch, I take this square. And as I said it, I grabbed one of the toy squares that was lying nearby, and I move it, you see, not northward, but... Yes, see, I move it upward, which is not northward, but I move it somewhere, not exactly like this, but somehow... I ended my sentence on that meaningless conclusion and shook the square in an absurd way, much to the amusement of my grandson, who burst out in laughter louder than before, and exclaimed that I wasn't trying to teach him, I was joking with him. And with that, he unlocked the door and ran out of the room. <clears throat> and that was the end of my first attempt to convert a student to the truth of three dimensions. <laughs> Section 22. How I then tried to diffuse the theory of three dimensions by other means and of the result. My failure with my grandson did not encourage me to try sharing my secret with anyone else in my household, but it didn't drive me to complete despair either. I had learned that I couldn't rely- oh, whoops, hold on. <coughs> this will be so much easier with a mouse wheel. I had learned that I couldn't rely entirely on the catchphrase, upward, not northward, but instead, I needed to create a demonstration that would allow the public a clear view on the whole thing, and writing seemed the best way to accomplish this goal. So I spent several months writing a textbook on the mysteries of the third dimension, but, in an attempt to avoid the law if it was possible, I didn't talk about the third dimension as a literal physical dimension, but a sort of thought land where, in theory, a figure could look down at flatland and see the inside of all things, and where, in theory, a figure with six squares and eight terminal points could be found. <clears throat> but while I was writing this book, I found myself constantly restrained by the impossibility of drawing the kinds of diagrams that were needed to explain the concepts. Because, of course, in our country of Flatland, there are no books except lines, and no diagrams except lines, all in one straight line, and only able to be told apart by differences of size and brightness. <clears throat> By the time I'd finished my textbook, which I had titled Through Flatland to Thoughtland, I wasn't sure that anyone would be able to understand it. In the meanwhile, I was living my life under a cloud. Everything that used to make me happy made me miserable, and everything I saw tempted me to speak out with treason, because I couldn't help but compare everything I saw in two dimensions with what it really was when seen in three, and I could barely stop myself from making these comparisons out loud. I neglected my clients and my own business as a lawyer to spend my time in contemplation of the mysteries I had once beheld that I couldn't share with anyone, and, my <clears throat> and I found myself losing grasp of the memories as the days progressed, finding it more and more difficult to clearly remember them even in my mind's eye. One day, about eleven months after my trip to Spaceland, I tried to imagine a cube and failed, but even though I succeeded afterward, I wasn't certain and I haven't been ever since, that I had imagined it correctly, in line with reality. This made me more depressed than I had been before, and made me determined to take some sort of action, but what kind I didn't know. I thought that I would even be willing to sacrifice my life for the cause, if I could at least convince anyone. But if I couldn't even convince my grandson, how could I convince the highest, most evolved circles in the land? 
but despite this, sometimes my passion was too strong for me, and in my venting, I let slip dangerous words. I was already considered to be dangerously close to scorning tradition, if not outright treasonous, and I was acutely aware of the danger I was in. But I still couldn't entirely stop myself from bursting out with suspicious and half-blasphemous phrases and comments, even when I was in even when I was with the highest of polygonal or circular society. For example, when the question was raised about the treatment of the lunatics who'd said they'd been given the power to see inside things, I responded with a quote from an ancient circle who had declared that prophets and inspired people are always considered by the majority to be prophets and inspired people are always considered by the majority to be mad, and I couldn't help but use expressions like the eye that sees the inside of things, and the all-seeing land. Once or twice, I even let slip the forbidden terms, the third and fourth dimensions. <clears throat> As the final nail in the coffin of a series of minor slip-ups, at a meeting of our local speculative society held at the palace of the prefect himself, some extremely silly person read an elaborate paper claiming to know the exact reasons why providence had limited the number of dimensions to two, and why the trait om of omnividence was given to that supreme being alone. And I forgot myself completely and told the entire exact story of my whole voyage with the sphere into space, then to the assembly hall in Metropolis, then to space again, and how I returned home, and everything I'd heard, everything I'd seen or heard during the incident in both reality and dream vision. At first I tried to pretend that I was describing the imaginary experiences of a fictional character, but my excitement quickly forced me to throw off any attempt at disguise, and finally, in a fevered pitch, I ended with a grand speech, attempting to convince all of my listeners to rid themselves of their prejudices and to become believers of the third dimension. Do I have to tell you that I was immediately arrested and brought before the council? The next morning, I was standing in the same place where just months ago, the sphere had stood himself. I was allowed to begin and continue my story without any questions or interruptions. But I already knew... Hey, don't scratch that. You have a scratching post. But I already knew my fate, because the president had noticed a guard of higher level isosceles with angles of almost at, or a little below 55 degrees, were originally assigned to the room, and he made sure to dismiss them before I was allowed to speak, replacing them with a much more disposable class of isosceles, whose angles were only two or three degrees. <clears throat> I knew what that meant. I was going to either be executed or imprisoned, and my story was going to be kept secret from the world by killing everyone in the room except for the president, and there was no point wasting such expensive, high-degree isosceles when they were, there were cheaper options available. After I finished my story, the president, maybe seeing that some of the younger circles had become sympathetic to me because of my apparent sincerity, asked me two questions. Could I? One. Could I explain or show what direction I meant when I used the words upward, not northward? 2. Could I show or describe to them the figure I was calling a cube without repeating the same list of imaginary sides and angles all over again? I declared that I couldn't provide any more evidence and that I would ha just have to stick to the truth, which it would be sure to prevail in the end. President replied that he agreed with my assessment that I couldn't offer any proof beyond my word. He sentenced me to lifetime imprisonment and said that if truth intended to free me from my cell to preach my gospel to the world. Hold on. Kitties. And the cats are doing stuff. And said that if truth intended to free me from my cell to preach my gospel to the world, then I should trust truth to bring that about. In the meantime, I wouldn't be forced to suffer any discomfort that wasn't necessary for keeping me locked up unless I gave up that privilege through misbehavior. And if I behaved well, I might be allowed to visit my brother who'd gone to prison before me every now and then. 
Seven years have passed, and I am still a prisoner. Except for the occasional visits from my brother, I have no company except for my jailers. My brother is one of the best squares. He is just, sensible, cheerful, and even feels some brother brotherly affection for me, but I have to confess that my weekly visits with him, in one sense, cause me the bitterest pain. He was there when the sphere manifested himself in the council chamber. He saw the spheres changing sections, and he heard the explanations of this given to the circles. Since that time, barely a week has ever gone by in these long seven year whole years when I haven't reminded him of the part I played in that manifestation, and given him, given him detailed descriptions of everything I saw and felt in Spaceland, and repeated endlessly the arguments for the existence of solids through the progression of analogy. But... And I hate to say it, my brother still hasn't understood anything I tell him, and flat out refuses to ever believe in the existence of a sphere. So you see, I have no students of my own, and as far as I can see, the millennial revelation was given to me for nothing was given to me all for nothing. Prometheus up in Spaceland was chained and punished for bringing down fire for mortals, but I, Poor flatland Prometheus, sit here in prison for bringing down nothing for my countrymen. But I continue on in the hope this, that this autobiography might, in some way I don't know how, find its way into the minds of humanity in some dimension, and might stir up a group of rebels who will refuse to be chained by limited dimensionality. <clears throat> that is what I hope for in my lightest moments. But alas, I cannot always be so optimistic. A heavy burden weighs on my mind. I can no longer honestly say that I am certain of the exact shape of that once-seen, often-longed-for cube, and in my nightly dreams the mysterious chant of upward, not northward, hunts me, haunts me like a soul-devouring sphinx. It is part of the punishment... <coughs> It is part of the punishment I endure for the cause of the truth that I experience seasons of mental weakness, when cubes and spheres fly away into a realm of impossible things, when the land of three dimensions seems almost as impossible as the land of one or none. Even the hard wall that keeps me from my freedom, and these very tablets I am writing on, and all other physical realities of Flatland itself, seem like nothing more than the ravings of a diseased mind or the baselic baseless fabric of a dream. This is the end of Flatland, an adventure in many dimensions, a 2024 translation. This is the lazy audiobook with no editing except to combine the various videos. The end. Enjoy. This is public domain, so if you would like to create your own audiobook or even edit this one, you can feel free. Good night.